You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 113 of the Common Descent Podcast. Today, we're talking about climate. Yeah. Specifically, paleoclimatology and the things that go into that subject. We'll discuss climate, what climate is, how we study climate today and in the past. We'll talk a bit about how climate has changed over time and how the study of ancient climate helps us to understand not only the climate of the past, but also the climate of the present and the concerning question of the climate of the future. Yeah, the ominous question. <laughs> the existential uh, concern. <laughs> so it's going to be a very exciting discussion that goes into a really crucial aspect of paleontology and geological studies. Agreed. And indeed, it's such a big and important topic of discussion that we thought it would be good to have another person join us. Yes. So, after we get through the announcements and the news this episode, we will be joined by special guest paleoclimatologist Dr. Rachel Lupian to tell us a bit about what paleoclimatology is, what a paleoclimatologist, like herself, does, and what it all means for our understanding of the world we live in. Yay! But not only is it an interesting and exciting subject, it was also requested. Yeah, that's why we're actually talking about it. Yeah, that's the real reason why we're doing an episode about it. This episode subject was requested by Raymond. Thank you very much for your request. And we want to give another shout out this episode to our friend Dr. Adrian Lamb of Time Scavengers, who was one of our guests on our Spotlight series, uh, for introducing us to Rachel, our guest today. Yeah, thanks for both suggesting good episodes and people, everyone. Yeah, a a whole (laughs) lot of voices have come together to make this uh, episode happen as it is. Before we get into the main topic, a couple of announcements. First and foremost, we have a Patreon. Mm -hmm. If you want to support the Common Descent podcast, there are lots of ways to do it. You can just listen to us. You can tell your friends about us. We love getting reviews on iTunes and such. Follow us on social media, all that sort of thing. But if you'd like to support us in a financial sense, you can do so by joining us on Patreon. We've got all sorts of different levels of subscription that come with extra goodies like bonus audios and behind-the-scenes insights. And, as you know, if you've listened to episodes of the podcast, at a certain level, we will shout out the names of our patrons as thanks. This episode, we shout out our thanks to Johan, Mason, Don, Evan, Josh, Daria, Arik, and a special shout out and happy birthday to Ron. Thanks, everyone, and happy birthday, Ron. <laughs> it, the list of patron shoutouts, on average, just keeps getting longer yeah. and longer. <laughs> eventually, eventually, it's going to be like the at the end of a commercial. <laughs> all the qualifications at the very end is going to be a really quick rattle off. <laughs> or you just make it the background music. <laughs> <laughs> As the episode starts, just a list of names. <laughs> Thanks to everybody who supports us financially or otherwise. Outside of that, we don't have any other specific announcements, but we will remind you that we do extra content every now and then. We did a silver screen science a little while back about the movie Godzilla vs. Kong, and we've got more plans coming up for the summer, including some more silver screen science. So stay tuned for that. And I think that's everything we have to say. Yeah, that sounds good. Well, in that case, let's move on to the news. News. Every episode, we like to present some bits of news from the scientific worlds of paleontology, biology, and the other things that interest us and interest the people that listen to us. Will, would you like to start us off? Yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, tyrannosaurs that might have hung out together. Okay. Friendly tyrannosaurs. Potentially. This is research by Alan Titus et al. and Pierre J. And the article we'll be linking to in the blog post is by Alex Fox in the Smithsonian Mag. So this is a study focusing on the remains of five Tyrannosaurs. So not Tyrannosaurus rex, but cousins of Tyrannosaurus rex. Tyrannosaurs, the broader group. These were found in southern Utah, and they were grouped together when found. Which immediately raises the question of, were you hanging out 
while alive, right? Where you just happen to be buried together or were you actually all hanging out? And so that's what this is bringing up. And it's a reoccurring question these days, especially with this group, because this is not the first grouping of tyrannosaurs that has been found. In fact, this makes the third mass grave of tyrannosaurs found in North America. Hmm. The first was found around 20 years ago and began the hypothesis that maybe these predators were social and so since then that's been debated back and forth some in support some less so this is yet another grouping fossil site that adds a bit more weight onto this is starting to seem less like coincidence and maybe more like a trend that something was causing them to be buried together since we found three notable ones yeah interesting Many resisting opinions to the idea of them grouping together just kind of holds that they don't show the brain power to hmm. be doing that. They just not thought that they were that high level socially based on their brain structure. But as they put it, these gr- these mass graves have to be reflecting some sort of behavior and not just a freak event happening over and over, which I thought was a really good way to sum it up. Yeah. It's like it's starting to... It would be almost too coincidental for us to find the same group grouping this way over and over is their suggestion. Now, these were found in 2014 in the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, a site nicknamed the Rainbows and Unicorn Quarry for how wonderful the fossil display, the fossils displayed there and uh, preserved there. (laughs) Fantastic. The specific tyrannosaurs uh, they're looking at, a genus known as Teratophonius, uh, which is based off the Greek words for both monster and murderer. So lovely. So, yep, that's <laughs> that's, that's what we're getting into. Uh, it lived late Cretaceous around 77 million years ago. And the bones they're looking at consist of one adult estimated to be about 22 years old and would have been around 30 feet long or just a little bit shorter than that. Okay. One subadult and two juveniles estimated at roughly four years old. Okay, so a, a, a range of ages. Mm-hmm. Uh, potentially two to three juveniles, actually. So the five range from adults to very young, and they tried, they attempted to see whether or not they were buried together. You know, not just that this was collecting tyrannosaurs, a spot that was collecting them, like a pitfall or a river, but that these five actually died and were buried simultaneously together. They looked at both physical evidence but also combine that with chemical analyses, including rare earth elements, stable carbon and oxygen isotopes, and charcoal concentrations. Hmm. None of the physical evidence could conclusively suggest that they died together, so there was no real support that way. But the chemistry does show some signs that they may have been together while dying, at least. Okay. The main part of that that seems to support is similarity in the rare earth elements found with the fossils. Suggests that they did indeed die together and were not just a place where tyrannosaur bodies were being collected. Right. That that during their life-slash-death-slash-burial process, they accumulated a similar chemical signature. Mm -hmm. Is what I would assume that that is what they're comparing there. Yeah, that's what it sounded like. And... The suggestion is that they may have drowned and then washed into the lake bed, is what it seems, or is suggested at least. Now, the article also had quotes from other researchers, both thinking that this does seem to be good support, that they indeed were living together and therefore potentially social, especially taking in the other mass graves, and others who were less convinced and said, we don't know that they were living together. They could have all just been there because of lack of resources or something else a body could have drawn them together and then they got caught and drowned together. Right. That they weren't necessarily together on purpose. Yes, exactly. That they weren't actually being gregarious. They just may have been in the same spot at the same time for the same reason, but not hanging out. So it's not a definite that they were social. And if anything, it is potentially support for gregariousness, grouping, but maybe not social, social behavior. Right. But there is ways we could explain it without, even that level of social behavior. So it's it's still not a, a nail in the coffin, but it is yet one more grouping of tyrannosaurs buried together. Yeah, it's interesting because it raises the, the question of, are these animals being social or not? 
ends up being much more complicated. Because even if you do find evidence that suggests, yeah, they were together at the same time and that's why they got buried, then the question becomes, okay, well, were they... Why were they together? Were they just drawn together by something similar? Are they a family grouping? Mm -hmm. Were they hunting together? Because I think at least one of the articles that I've seen going around about this study is something like, was Tyrannosaurus a pack hunter? Yep. And it's like, okay, but that's not the only possible solution to why a group of animals was together. Yeah, that's a, a couple of leaps of logic away from just maybe they were together at the same time they died. Right. Is this a case? And we've talked about social behavior in other episodes, especially in episode 111 about eusociality, that some animals will live together as family groups for a little while mm -hmm. and then split up. Some will live together in groups their whole lives. And then others like uh, Komodo dragons or your favorite example of saltwater crocodiles. Sometimes they just end up in the same place because that's where the food is, but they're not hanging out together on purpose yeah they don't really like each other <laughs> right given the choice <laughs> they would not be associating with each other well the other thing that i th and we've mentioned this before when pack hunting in fossil groups comes up uh that's a very cool idea mm -hmm. but that is not a common behavior no like among predators there's not a lot of them that pack hunt there's some big famous ones dolphins and wolves you know and lions we know really really well but when you actually look at all of predators, that's more the anomaly than the trend. Even predators that live in groups. Like, there's yeah. plenty of dogs that live in groups and don't pack hunt. And right. there's plenty of other social predators that still hunt individually. Because pack hunting is kind of a step up from your typical social grouping. Yeah. So what I think is interesting, we talked about this in another news recently about how so much work gets done on tyrannosaurs because we have good fossils of them and they're big and they're charismatic, but has implications elsewhere. And the question of social behavior and even pack hunting or family groupings in dinosaurs has come up over and over and over again for lots of dinosaurs, especially predatory dinosaurs like Velociraptor and like T-Rex. So as we sort out these questions, it could potentially help us figure out how to find the answers not only for the tyrannosaurs, but for other dinosaurs that these questions have come up with. Yeah. Which is a very cool, uh, always a step in the in the right direction. Well, I've got another dinosaur news, but I'm going to hold off. We'll, we'll space out the dinosaur news for today. And instead, I'm going to start with another story of predation. Mm -hmm. Actually, both of my news is relate to predation today. But this one is about a squid that got bit. Hey, cool. Yeah, it's a cool study. This is research by Christian Klug et al. in the Swiss Journal of Paleontology. And we'll link to an article on live science by Laura Gegel. Way back in episode 16, we talked about cephalopods. And we mentioned that cephalopods today include octopus, squid, cuttlefish, and nautiluses. Mm -hmm. But that they included lots of other animals in the past, including among them, belemnites. Which had the little spear tip heads like on the end of their mantle. Yeah, so these are torpedo shaped like squid today with a bunch of arms at one end, and yeah, a little, a hard tip at the, on the rostrum, right, the, the, the tip of the body. This new research regards a particular fossil of a belemnite from the Jurassic period of a site in southwestern Germany, around 180 million years ago, of the species Passalotuthus levigata, which is known from places in Europe and Morocco. This particular one was discovered in a quarry in 1970. It is a little, tiny belemnite, the body is about four inches or nine centimeters long. Aww. Each of the arms is about the same length, four inches or nine centimeters. What is special about this specimen, this one particular belemnite, is a few things. Number one, it is one of the very few belemnite specimens known that preserves soft tissues. In fact, the article uh, has the one of the authors quoted as saying that there are only about 10 belemnite specimens known that preserve good soft tissue remains. Wow, just barely double digits. This is one of them. It's got parts of the arms, it's got parts of the body. Another thing of note is that the remains of the arms seem to be surrounding the remains of the exoskeleton of a crustacean. Ooh. Near the mouth of the belemnite. So it seems that this was fossilized with its arms. In the, and in fact, in the article, it describes it as embracing. <laughs> it's just a hug. Just a, just a friendly little hug. Aww. And the other thing that's really unique about this specimen 
is that the arms are well preserved and the tip of the rostrum is well preserved, but nothing in between. Mm. The middle section is missing. And based on the way it's preserved and the way things are missing, the authors have interpreted it as an animal that had grabbed some crustacean to to eat and then got eaten. (laughs) Or at least partially eaten. That it was bitten by a predator, a chunk was taken out of it, and the leftovers were dropped to the seafloor where they became fossilized. Wow, I'm picturing the, the, you know, cliche picture, the classic picture of the surfer leg after yes. being bit. Just a uh, crunk, but still with a surrounding bit. You know, not bitten in half, just crunk. Yep, just pieces. The authors point out that finds like this are not unheard of, that there are other fossil finds that are interpreted as remains that were partially predated upon, not necessarily scavenged, but a predator attacked prey and left pieces behind. And in this paper, they suggest a name for it. They suggest two terms, leftover fall, (laughs) for the phenomenon of remains dropping to be buried and fossilized, and the term pabulite pabulite for the fossilized remains of a meal that didn't enter the digestive tract okay as opposed to coprolites which are things that came out the other end cololite which is a preserved material while it was inside the gut of a fossilized organism uh regurgitolites which is a catch-all term for stuff that gets spit back out and then fossilized they suggest pabulite from the Latin pabulum, which means food, and light comes from lithos, for rock. Mm-hmm. Partially eaten, leftovers of a meal that got yeah, fossilized. Scraps. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but if you think about it like when Cookie Monster eats cookies. Yes. Yep. <laughs> there a, lot of, a lot of stuff doesn't get eaten. In fact, all of it doesn't get eaten. What? You're breaking my immersion. They have a few suspects for who might have been the biter in this case. Uh, the main suspect, and this is the one that the live science article focuses on and that the, the actual study discusses in detail, is a shark named Hybotus. And the reason that they suspect the shark, uh, one, is because it's right time, right place, right size. Two is probably because it's a shark and that's exciting to think about. And, and that is very shark bitey esque Yep. And there is one specimen of Hybotus known with a belly full of bolemnite remains including lots of the hard tip of the the body part of the squid, the bolemnite. So the tip of the body is mineralized. It's like it's, a pin cap. Yes. And indeed, the people who have researched that specimen of Hybotus have suggested that it might have eaten too many of those, and that might be why it died. Oh, it got backed up with little spear tips. Yeah, it ate all these undigestible hard parts of the squid and couldn't pass them. And they point to the part, the fact that this partially eaten bolemnite seems to have been a bite that avoided the hard part at the end of the body. That this may, much like we've talked about lots of predators today, will eat only specific parts of their prey. The good stuff. And avoid, oftentimes, the hard parts that they can't digest. That being said, we don't know for sure if this was something that Hybotus did. They list other uh, potential biters, including uh, there are many large fish known from this part of the world at this time. There are ichthyosaurs, and there are marine crocs. So it could be all any number of predators, but uh, they're interpreting this as a bite that avoided the parts that the predator didn't want to eat. Yeah, that's a fascinating find. Well-preserved belemnite with potentially food in its, almost in its mouth. Yeah, while it was eating, it got et. And that's fantastic. And also actually makes a good bit of sense because you're fairly vulnerable while you're hunting. Yeah, and they, they point that out in the article. Like, that's a good time for other predators to seek you out is when you're focusing on your prey. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple other interesting notes about this that are just fun things they were able to to point out. The crustacean, uh, based on the remains, is the genus Proarion, which is a lobster-like uh, crustacean. But the poor preservation, the poor condition of the remains make them suspect that it might have been a molt. 
Oh. So crustaceans will shed their exoskeleton, much like, you know, spiders do that and lots of other arthropods do that. And apparently cephalopods today will often eat the molts of crustaceans. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, me neither. So this may have been, it may have grabbed a molt and was eating it when it got bit. And they also point out that two of the Belemnite arms, so the Belemnite arms have two rows of hooks running down them, like a lot of, uh, uh, like squid, you know, often do today. Many squid have either hooks or little, like, toothy rings around the suction cup. And those are hard and they preserve nicely. So this fossil has rows of these well-preserved hooks where the arms were. It just, it looks like a video game whip. (laughs) Yes. Just lined down the length with backwards facing hooks. Two of the arms had very large hooks that I guess might have been at the tip or along the length that they're not sure what those are about. Yeah, I I looked at this article when I was trying to pick out news and it was like really, really well preserved Belemnite. I was like, well, I want to see the picture. I don't know that I'm going to do this one. It's a cool picture. And I looked at it and I went, why are there two like ram horns? Two big ram horn like hooks that they say might and there is no this is speculation at this point, as they admit, could be arms adapted for mating purposes, Mm -hmm. which might mean this is a male, but they are very quick to say, yeah, we don't actually know if that's true. No, because there's, we don't know of any cephalopod that has structures like that. That would be unique to this Belemnite. Yeah, this is the first time we've ever (laughs) seen something like, we've, hooks on arms, that's fine. Yeah. Hook arms... Yep. (laughs) It is very different. So this is one of those fossil specimens that's just seven layers of cool, intriguing information. Yeah, it's a fossil casserole. It's just a smorgasbord, (laughs) and it's fantastic. Wow. Well, my next news is not about predation, but is about a predator. Okay. Still, so continuing the theme. All right, the whole whole news. And I'm bringing it back to archosaurs. Okay, fine. I bet it's about a croc. The best archosaurs, indeed. (sighs) You knew it. Fine. This is research that may have finally placed where the horned crocs are in the croc family tree. Oh, hopefully not at the bottom. No, they are they are right next to the the real crocs. <laughs> <laughs> this is research by Ivan Hekola et al. in Communications Biology, and the article is by Harry Baker in Live Science. So this is kind of a big deal, at least among croc phylogeny. Because these horned crocs have been controversial for about 150 years. Ooh. Which is why finally getting them placed is exciting. So what are horned crocs? Please tell us. Now, these are not crocs with, like, actual horns. But at the back of a croc's skull, where the ear is, behind the eye, there's two little bumps before you get to the neck. If you look at a picture, you can see it. These crocs have very exaggerated bumps. Okay. So that. these are these are horned in the in the same style as like the horned frogs. Yes, exactly. There's these extra little big spiky bumps. Your your skull just extends in these areas <laughs> to kind of a, a horny projection to right at the back of the head. And funnily enough, the skull bones projecting, you know, extending into spines or whatever is how a lot of especially reptiles do it. A lot of dinosaurs with cool skull stuff like ceratopsians. That's what it is. It's just bones that have extended into new shapes. Just their face stretched out. The specific horn croc in question is Voe robustus, which is a species endemic to Madagascar, where many of the horn crocs are known from. Episode 40. These are known to have been around from around 9,000 years ago to somewhere between 1,400, 1,300 years ago. Okay, so real recent. Real recent. Holocene. They're not ridiculously big. They, we don't have any complete specimens of them, but we have their robust skull, which is where they get their name from. But based on their skull, it's likely that they ranged roughly in similar size category to the Nile crocodile today. Okay, so decently sized, decently pretty big. Si- yeah, the article said uh, horn crocs were not particularly large crocs, and then said they were likely similar overall in size to Nile crocs. I mean, you mean the second biggest croc? So I guess they're saying... They're not particularly large fossil crocs if the first thing that comes to mind when you think fossil crocs is Dinosuchus and Sarcosuchus. That's what I assume. (laughs) They're not giant crocs. No. These are not 30, 40 foot crocs, but they're only slightly shy of 20 foot, but still not small crocs. Uh, And coincidentally, Nile crocs are known in Madagascar today. So, you know, there you go, Uh, which we may talk about a little bit later. 
Now, the first discovery of these crocs was in 1872, and initially they were classified uh, in a few different families, and some were confused with other species and given a few different names, and there was no clear evolutionary origin to them at the time. This is partially, uh, the difficulty of placing them was partially due to the not great fossil record of Madagascar, that it just doesn't have a super complete fossil preservation there, but it's also just due to the fact that we do a lot of identification on crocs based on their skull, and croc, because that preserves well often, but croc skulls can be very convergent. Yeah, they can look very, very similar, even among distantly related groups. Yeah, they can evolve the same shapes over and over and over again. And even within an individual species, the skull shape changes drastically throughout their life. Yeah. So an adult versus a juvenile versus a mid-aged croc could look like individual species if you don't have a good growth range of that species. It complicates things, and it has definitely uh, shown up in this situation. Initially, though, when they were first identified and given a, a place in the taxonomy, they were grouped with true crocodiles, crocodilus, which is what all crocodiles today are in except for a couple. And they were given the name Crocodilus robustus, so true crocs. In 1910, this got confused a bit because the article published about them used a picture and actually used a picture of the Nile crocodile. Oops. And this kind of reinforced that, yeah, they were true crocodiles, and some people even started pushing that they may have been ancestral to Nile crocodiles. Ooh. Until 2007, when further analysis on the skull realized, no, they're probably not even true crocodiles. Huh. <laughs> like, there's some distinct differences. They're definitely not ancestral or closely related to Niles, and they may not even be crocodilus. And that's when they got Voye as their genus. Oh, so these have defied specific classification for quite a while. It's that bouncing back and forth, unclear origination and grouping. For a while, they were in a subfamily of dwarf crocodiles. This new study uses genetic material, DNA evidence, Ooh. to study their grouping. For fossil DNA evidence? Yes, they were able to recover partial mitochondrial genomes from very recent, toward the end, 1400 to 1300 year old crocs horned crocs very cool not a lot of studies have been done on ancient dna of reptiles no so this is awesome and it did indeed reveal some interesting information it said they were not true crocs so not crocodilus not crocodilus they were also not dwarf crocs okay so they're not grouped in either of the groups that they were majorly put in before this and in fact most likely are their own unique genus Ooh. separate from the ones we've identified so far and as they put it, not true within true crocodiles, but adjacent to it, and maybe an isolated lineage on this island. Okay, so possibly a Madagascar specific group. But they're not, you know, adjacent to it, so they're not like some long divergent holdover from some ancestor back in the Cretaceous or whatever. They're they're crocs, they're just their own little branch of crocs. Exactly. Which is significant. Because having a closely related separate lineage in Madagascar, which is part of Africa, adds significant support to the theory that true crocodiles originated in Africa, mm. which has been the theory up till now. And this is a, a really good weight on that side of the scale that indeed it seems that we have a closely related lineage that also seems isolated to the Africa area. So it, it seems that this is uh, both cool because now we have a grouping for the horn crocs and it sure does seem like, yep, crocs, actual crocodiles that we call crocodiles today originated in Africa. With this as an offshoot yes. of our or origination space of African crocodiles. Yeah. Close cousins to the group that is true crocodiles, but good support that true crocodiles got their origination there. Very cool. That's a, I, I, it's always, I am very excited to hear about ancient DNA with reptiles. We don't get that very much at all. I think we talked about a tortoise that we got some ancient DNA out of. Oh, yeah. Many in news at some episode. It was the one the from the tropics that was big yep. deal because it was the tropics. Yep. And I mean, indeed, this is Madagascar. Yeah. So a rare find indeed. It's, it's pretty neat stuff. There's still some mysteries to solve. Like, we don't know why they went extinct. Uh, one potential mm -hmm. hypothesis is due to Nile crocodiles, because Nile crocodiles are invasive 
to naturally invasive, but invasive to Madagascar. Yeah. Uh, there's only evidence for Nile crocodiles, uh, solid evidence for Nile crocodiles in Madagascar about 300 years old, but there's, there's tales from the Malagasy people that suggest they may have been there earlier and potentially overlapped with horned crocodiles. Oh, interesting. So many unanswered questions about the history of these crocs. Yeah, mysterious horned crocs. Very cool. Well, let's do one last news. This is about dinosaurs. It is about predatory dinosaurs, continuing the theme, but specifically the behavior and habits. This one's about dinosaurs, predatory dinosaurs, continuing the theme, specifically evidence for nocturnal habits. Okay. Particularly strong evidence for particularly specialized nocturnal habits. Particularly nocturnal habits. Particularly. This is research in the journal Science by Jonah Schoenier et al. And we will link to yet another article in Live Science. This one by Mindy Weisberger. The question of diurnal or nocturnal or habits in dinosaurs, like when during the day they have they were active, has come up numerous times in the past, and a number of studies have used different aspects of their biology to try to infer this. This study looks specifically at vision and hearing in dinosaurs. What they did was they looked at the physical proxies, so that is the physical anatomical features that can tell us about vision and hearing, across dozens of dinosaurs, both living, modern birds, and extinct theropods specifically. To examine vision, they looked at a structure called the scleral ring. This is a ring of bone that sits within the eye socket, which is seen in lots of dinosaurs, uh, including birds. Also, lizards often have that. Ichthyosaurs uh, famously have that. The size of the scleral ring is related to the maximum dilation of the pupil, which is related to low light vision. Yeah, the bigger you can open your pupil, the more light you can let in. Yes, that's and why when you put a cat in the dark, the pupils expand into this big orb to let in lots of light. For hearing, they looked at the structure of the inner ear, the cochlea, specifically looking at the length of this canal within the inner ear, because studies have shown that the length of this canal is related to hearing. Oh. How well you can hear. They took 3D scans and made 3D models of all these features across lots of dinosaurs and modern birds and were able to characterize a range of vision and hearing among different groups of dinosaurs. Specifically, they found evidence of good low-light vision and hearing in a group of theropods called the Alvarezsauroids. So this is a group that is... Clo in the same general grouping as things like Therizinosaurs and Dromaeosaurs and Tyrannosaurs, that sort of the feathery corner of the dinosaur family tree. <laughs> the fuzzy, the fuzzy group. So this seems to be a group adapted f to have good low light vision and hearing, potentially for dim light habits. And specifically within this group is a species known as Shuvuya deserti, which appears to be extremely specialized for low light activity. Indeed, the articles being written about this study are focusing on this dinosaur and calling it very much like an owl. Yeah, I've seen the them using that title. And indeed, uh, a lot of the birds they were comparing to are owls and nightbirds. Birds that tend to have very good low light vision and very good hearing for hunting at night. Makes sense. Shavuia desert eye comes from the late Cretaceous of Mongolia in an ancient habitat that was a desert, hence the name. It is a very small creature. It's about two feet long, so not quite a meter, with long, slender back legs, powerful front arms, and a small beak, and very large eyes. Hmm. Their study found that the vision and hearing of Shavuia was better than any of the birds included in this study. Whoa! And they specifically point that the hearing, based on the anatomy of the inner ear that they modeled, is, to quote the author in the article, off the charts. Wow. Better than the best known hearing among birds today in the barn owl. Huh. So this was a dinosaur that had better hearing than, as far as we know, any modern birds. Man, what were you listening to? Uh, probably <laughs> everything <laughs> <laughs> whatever we wanted <laughs> just, just sitting there it, like, hearing it all like superman yes <laughs> sitting on top of a mountain and knowing everything that's happening 
This evidence suggests to them that Shuvuya it was, in their words, almost certainly a nocturnal animal. Excellent low light vision, excellent hearing. In comparison with other dinosaurs, uh, they specify in the article Velociraptor, which seems to have intermediate features, possibly for twilight hunting. Right, not at night, but during sunset or or during sunrise. Crepuscular. Yeah. And furthermore, they point out that the hearing and vision interpreted here in this species of dinosaur makes some of its other features make more sense. (gasps) They note that there are lots of mammals today that are nocturnal desert dwellers that have... Long, slender back legs and powerful front arms. Yeah, they do. Legs for getting around quick and arms for digging through uh, sediment to get at their food. Yeah. That they have great vision for being able to see and get around. Great hearing for locating their prey, potentially buried somewhere. Powerful arms for digging that prey out. And then strong, you know, long back legs for getting away if they need to. So they called this an uh, an owl dinosaur, but it should have been a kangaroo rat dinosaur. Sounds like a kangaroo rat to me. That's fantastic. So they point out that not only is this the, as they put it, the strongest evidence we have for nocturnal habits in a dinosaur, in a, you know, non-living dinosaur, but also it's loaded with convergent adaptations that we see in mammals today. Fantastic. How cool. A little owl rat dinosaur. I love it so much. Not only because, wow, that's such interesting results, but also it sounds just utterly unbearably adorable. Yeah. I. It, it's most likely fuzzy. It's got giant eyes. It's got big old eyes and long, long spindly legs, and it's just, yeah. it's small enough to fit in my lap. It's got little hands that were probably, you know, right up, held close to the body before, while it wasn't digging. That I could hand stuff to, and it could, oh, it'd yeah. be so cute. This is a very cool dinosaur. This one, this one might be pushing out Simosuchus for the, the <laughs> extinct animal I want brought back as a house pet. It would be a pet. You, it would dig all over the place. Though. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it would... I'd have to have a backyard. <laughs> well, and it would be like a cat. It'd be up at night running around. <laughs> it would get the zoomies at it two in the morning. It would get the zoomies just with these big gangly legs. <laughs> uh, I love this both because that's a cool study of we're going to combine these features for sight and hearing over multiple groups, which I'm always a fan of when we say, you know, when we don't just go, all right, we're studying this species this way. We're studying a whole bunch, mm-hmm. comparing as many as we can. But there's always something so amazing to me. And and I feel like realigning perspective when we have a result like this, where not only does it show strong signs, but stronger signs. Yeah, we, we put together a chart based on what we know from a bunch of other animals. And this one is off of that chart. Yep, we didn't make the chart <laughs> big enough. It's not bounded by our comparisons. And I feel like that's... Results like this are important to remind us, you know, things we've said before, but dinosaurs were also very specialized and there are surely members within dinosaurs that were the best at things that are still being done today. Yeah. We just can't, you know, it's harder to confirm it because we can't just, we can't make a documentary about watching them do it. Yeah. Uh, I, I love it. Yeah. And that's why uh, when it comes to nocturnal habits, Shavuia Desert Eye really is... The, the most, most extreme. extreme. <laughs> that's a that's a reference that a lot of our audience is not going to get. <laughs> Ask Google. Well, that's it for the news this episode, which means it's time to go on to our main topic. This episode, we will be discussing climatology, paleoclimatology, climate change, and just all sorts of great questions about climate and climate studies. And we will be able to ask those questions to our guest, Dr. Rachel Lupian. So when we return from our short musical interlude, we'll get into the main event of the episode. Woo! Stay tuned. Hello, Rachel. Hello, David and Will. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. We're very excited to have you join us today for our discussion of paleoclimate and climate. Before we get into the meat of the discussion, if you would, please introduce yourself for our listeners. 
Sure. I'm Rachel Lupian. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral research scientist at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is part of Columbia University in Palisades, New York. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland originally. I was a geology major in college, um, but now I'm more focused on paleoclimatology. Great. And so you are a paleoclimatologist. I am. That's so convenient. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> well, that's great. <laughs> Wait, really? <laughs> Thanks for being here. What? A, what? Wow. <laughs> what are the odds? Hasn't hasn't this worked out great? <laughs> we are going to ask, so often we'll ask uh, our guests to give them a chance to talk a bit about their research, and I, there will be opportunity to do that later in the episode. But let's go ahead and get right into our discussion. We're going to discuss climate today through history, how we study it. Let's start with the very basics. Can you, as we often do, with a simple question with a complex answer, <laughs> Yeah. what is climate? So technically speaking, climate is a 30-year average of weather. So they're not the same thing, but they are related. A lot of talk today about global warming is just the temperature aspect of climate. But it, climate is much more than that. So it also includes um, precipitation, humidity, wind even, and many other components make up the climate system. Cool. I didn't know there was a, a year rain. Like, I didn't know there was a specific measure on it. Yeah, that is the technical definition. Um, but we study climate on the annual cycle, the seasonal cycle, and millions of years into the past as well. Right, right. Yeah, I've often heard it. Weather is, you know, a daily pattern, sometimes even, you know, hourly. What is it doing right now? Whereas when we talk about climate, we're often talking about, you know, what you can expect to encounter when you go to a certain region. Yeah, exactly. And climate and weather have a lot of chaos in the system. And so when we want to talk about trends or variability through time or what the future is going to do, we really want to stick to these sort of temporal averages. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that these different climate parameters like temperature, like precipitation, um, these are more or less important in different regions. So for instance, at the poles, um, you know, we know that the, the Earth is warming, but at the poles, um, uh, that region is warming at twice the rate as the rest of the Earth. Um, in the tropics, we know from studying past climate change that the temperature doesn't actually change all that much. And so when, we're, when we want to understand how climate changes, we actually um, measure things like precipitation, um, and, and evaporation and stuff like that um, to characterize tropical climate a bit more. That makes sense. Gotcha. So not only is climate different in different regions, right? The tropics obviously have a different climate than the Sahara, right. than a rainforest, than a, the poles, but they can also change differently in different parts. Yeah, you know, we often think of climate as a global, you know, we're talking about global climate yeah. change. Right. That uh, there's like a, a world thermostat that we're adjusting right but yeah. that that change over time can be different in different regions exactly um it can also be different at different time scales um which i think we'll we might get to a bit later but very cool very interesting already already it's, yeah. it's more complicated than <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> like i said a simple question with a very complex answer so uh obviously we talk about climate a lot in our modern world, and we talk about climate a lot in terms of paleontological studies on the podcast, climate comes up a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. uh, the news that we discuss often involves climate studies. What is the importance of climate? How, how does climate influence, you know, paleontolog paleontologists, we're studying life. How does climate influence the life that lives in different regions? Right. So climate certainly affects life in different regions, as, as you just said. Um, but I, it's also really important to keep in mind that climate affects itself. So it's full of these interconnected processes, meaning that temperature rises at one location due to some external forcing, whether that be anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions or natural cycles. And that temperature rise will cause the ice to melt, will, which will then cause the ocean circulation to change, which will then feed back on the carbon dioxide loop, for instance. Right. So climate itself also affects climate, um, <laughs> which, <laughs> which makes it very complicated, but also very interesting to study. Another way that climate can directly affect Earth 
on sort of these very long millions to billions of years time scales, it can affect uh, the rock cycle. So if, say, it, there's an increase in uh, rainfall over a mountain belt, um, that, can, that can weather, chemically weather those rocks. And in that reaction, rocks generally absorb CO2. Um, and so there, there's then this, this other feedback between sort of climate and tectonics um, at some point. But right. back to your original question, <laughs> in terms of life, flora and fauna, um, climate has a huge impact. So the amount of rainfall or the temperature can have huge effects on uh, the vegetation on the landscape, whether there are trees or grasslands or something in between or a desert. It can affect the location of the forests, um, which could have an indirect effect sort of on the, on the animals living on the landscape in terms of habitat and resources and even uh, shade. But climate can also have a, a, a very direct um, sort of influence on, uh, on the biosphere in terms of water availability, heat stress, drought, that kind of thing um, can really affect species living in any given region. As we've seen, biologists have shown drastic changes in species that they're studying. Yeah. Well, and I think that, like you said earlier, so often we think of climate as temperature. You know, that's sort of the first thing that often comes to mind. Right. But, you know, uh, the temperature requirements of a species can can end up being a pretty small deal compared to something like precipitation, mm -hmm. that it might be the right temperature. Things that live in a tropical rainforest aren't going to make it in a desert. Yeah. Temperature yeah. is similar, but there's all sorts of other impacts. We even had, there was a news recently about how some species are adapted to weather patterns in certain areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had a news bit about how lizards might on tropical islands might be evolving to weather uh, hurricanes. <laughs> and so that part of the climate that a species might be adapted to can be the weather that comes along with the particular climate region. Yeah, the in. anomalies right. or the seasonal weirdness. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I also liked your point about climate affecting itself, because I feel like that's something else that people often mistake is, uh, especially because we, we use terms like biomes and stuff. and you know, regions that it often is portrayed that's like there's a desert and there's in this invisible barrier where the desert climate ends and then next to it is a grassland climate. Right, like Minecraft. Yeah. You just walk directly <laughs> from the desert into the grassland. But the truth is that, yeah, if something weird happens in the mountains that border a desert and the climate starts shifting in that mountainous area, then it's going to affect its neighbor. Definitely. And if rainfall leaves one area, it has to go somewhere else and... I, I think that's a good point that climates are not uh, in pockets. Yeah, and even on a broader scale, I mean, a lot of our global climate signals are, are sort of driven by um, the high northern latitudes. So when you get a, a warmer atmosphere, I don't mean to scare everyone, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you when we cause a warmer um, atmosphere, we're going to get ice sheet loss, which we're seeing. That ice sheet, that that um, fresh water, you know, goes into the ocean, and um, that sort of fresh water cap on the northern Atlantic that has da downstream pun not intended downstream effects on ocean circulation, which has global effects on um, heat transport within the ocean, which translates to heat transport changes in the atmosphere, which translates to sometimes precipitation in the tropics. So even, even uh, warming that we cause or um, solar radiation that's hitting the high northern latitudes, that's sort of a hot spot for, um, for triggering this, some global climate transitions. Yeah. So climate in one region can affect the climate in another region. So climate doesn't yeah. affect just affect itself. It also affects other climate zones. Yeah, definitely. And now you, you have already been touching on this, but I was going to ask, you mentioned earlier that climate affects life and climate affects the earth processes uh, around it and underneath it, uh, in a sense. <laughs> but it also works the other way, too, that changes in the earth, changes in tectonic patterns and ocean circulation, and even changes in life can affect the climate. Yeah, definitely. There's all sorts of different um, of feedbacks. I mean, if you want to think on these longer terms, when you have you know, um, plate tectonics and you're, you build an, a mountain belt, those, that rock is going to get, you know, I mean, 
these are long time scales, but shot up into the air and that rock will be more susceptible to rock weathering. And, um, and that will in turn affect the amount of greenhouse gases in, in the atmosphere, which, you know, as I said, have these downstream effects of um, temperature change and otherwise. Also, if you just think of volcanoes, right? I mean, when a volcano goes, uh, erupts, you see um, aerosols into the atmosphere and that can have cooling effects. Um, but then in other cases, depending on the chemistry and the just the characteristics of the volcano can also have warming effects um, and on different time scales as well. Yeah. One of the most memorable moments that I took with me from my time as an undergraduate uh, in Penn State in a geology class, I don't remember which one it was, it was one of the higher level classes, I had to take it twice, it was very <laughs> complicated. One day, our professor described the climate changing trends over the course of the Cenozoic, and he put it in uh, you know, simple terms that over the course of the Cenozoic, Cooling temperatures might be related to the spread of grasslands, uh, which have led to the kind of ecosystems we have today, and that one of the things suggested that might have contributed to the spread to the cool to those cooling temperatures, those cooling climates, was the rise of the Himalayas, creating lots more weathering surface that absorbs CO two out of the atmosphere. And he punctuated this by looking over the class with an expression that I understand now, having been a teacher of college classes. And he said, so the rising of the Himalayas might have led to the earth being taken over by grasslands. And if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that you said it. Um, on these really long time scales, you see these directional changes, these, these long term cooling or warming um, trends. And those are generally caused by these these tectonic um, events or just um, movement of the plates or whatever. Um, they can also have effects on the topography and the bathymetry of the ocean. You can have different seaways that open and close over these millions of year timescales, and that can affect atmospheric circulation patterns, and which again, have all these downstream effects. So it sounds complicated, <laughs> <laughs> which brings us to the next point that we want to discuss, which is how we come to understand all of this. Obviously, climate systems are very complicated. So let's start with modern day climate before we go uh, on a, a journey into the past. What tools do climatologists, do scientists use to study climate today? Right. So we have um, instrumental uh, records. So observations that have been made temperature back to about 150 years ago. There are monitoring stations for carbon dioxide, air temperature, sea temperature, um, and local sea level, things like that. So there are global measurements going on that there is a, a strong showing in the community that uses that data to understand very recent climate as well as um, projecting into the future. So we also use climate models. So um, these are computer simulations of the climate system. They're based on physical theory. Um, they're, they're validated often with past climate reconstructions. Um, but now that climate models have been around for, you know, a, a couple decades or so, we, we're actually validating them as we speak. So there, there are model simulations that ran and now we are, um, the earth is running its experiment and, and um, <laughs> we're able to, to validate them. And it's actually, they're, they're often very right. Um, and of course, that's right. within these major error bars, but often specific aspects of those climate models are, are um, often spot on. Um, and there's also ways of, of doing that where you run 10 different climate models that use slightly different physics or different integration areas or time steps um, and, and sort of average them to get uh, an idea of, of what the, the climate system is doing. So if I understand what you're saying, we've got... All this climate data that we've measured from around the world, and then we use our understanding of that climate to create these models, which we can then run to make predictions about the future, but the models that we ran 10 or 20 years ago are now being tested against our observations of what's actually happened. Yeah, exactly. So we, we have models that we started <laughs> in, you know, 2002 or whatever, and we can say, well, they predicted this over the next 10 years, and we know how good a job they did and we've been able to adjust 
as needed. Yeah, exactly. And they're getting better every day. Um, and their computational power is get also getting better every day. So we can, we can run longer experiments and uh, higher resolution experiments. And yeah. And these observations that we're making these days, so obviously we have, you mentioned monitoring stations that are getting, you know, air pressure, wind, temperature, etc. Are those just using our standard weather detecting, you know, thermometers and barometers? Barometers. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And they're scattered all over the world. Um, And so, right, somebody can measure their sea level on the east coast of the United States and somebody can measure it off the west coast of Australia. And um, that data can all be compiled and, and looked at globally. Are there parts of the world that are better monitored than others? For sea level? For climate in general? Um, well, I mean, as we know, the, the climate is complicated and, and regionally v- variable. And so I think it's important to get sort of this globally resolved um, sort of network of stations. I mean, I will tell you that uh, a professor at the University of Hawaii, there is a, a station in Mauna Loa, Hawaii, that is sort of the official carbon dioxide uh, measure of the world. So, I mean, things like that, like carbon dioxide, um, that's very well mixed in the atmosphere. And so you're not actually going to see a lot of variability globally, but temperature, obviously you will. Sea level, you also do because of of various, um, various aspects of tectonics and, and gravity and stuff like that. Yeah, right. When you look at a climate data, I assume that you're looking at a lot of maps when you look at data for, for climate around the world. Uh, I guess what I'm getting at is, are there places where there's a lot of good data? Like, is the U.S. particularly well monitored compared to like, I don't know, islands in the Pacific or something where maybe there's not as much access? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's there's definitely more monitoring um, going on in the United States as well as in Europe. But I think there's there's a big push to increase that um, that, that coverage of the whole the whole earth. Great. Neat. It's it's climate monitoring, as I always like to compare things to whenever I get the chance, gives me a similar feeling when I think about like how we're studying space in that a lot of the things we're documenting aren't going to be useful now, but will be more useful once we've collected enough. Like we haven't mapped the sky, but we're mapping here and eventually it will fill in the map. And with climate data, you're recording this month, but really you need to record for years before now you can look back at what was recorded 10 years ago, 30 years ago. And that's interesting. Yeah, definitely. And it's not just to to have a very long instrumental record, but we also use this instrumental data, again, to validate models. So if we have a, if we have a climate model that we want to project what Earth's going to look like in, in 2100, we want to run that model during a climate state that we know what happened. Um, And if it gets that right, it has a better chance of predicting the future correctly. We can also use instrumental data to um, compare against these paleoclimate reconstructions, which I'm happy to talk, more than happy to talk about. (laughs) Um, But we can use these these actual like observations that we're making um, and compare those to proxy records. Um, so these, these paleoclimate reconstructions, and we can calibrate those reconstructions to the, uh, to the measurements. Gotcha. Well, since you're more than happy to talk about it, let's <laughs> move into paleoclimate a bit. So we've talked about how we study climate today. And I assume, as with basically everything, it becomes uh, several stages more difficult when we try to do it in the fossil record. So what tools, what instruments, what data are we using to study climate in the past? Yeah, so there's two sort of terms that I think are really important. So you have your climate archive, and that could be a sediment core from the ocean or from a lake. Um, Those are my two favorite. You could also Mm. have an ice core or a stalagmite or a coral Um, There's all sorts of things that um, sort of accumulate over time, and you can then um, measure climate proxies from. So proxies are something that you measure to represent something else, so some aspect of climate. They can be as simple as what color was the sediment in that sediment archive. 
which could be representative of lake depth or something like that. Um, you could also have plant pollen that's preserved in a sediment archive, um, which represents the plants that were on the landscape at that time. So you have, an, you have these proxies that are preserved in archives, and those sorts of lists of archives and proxies are added to all the time. People are figuring out new ways to study different aspects of the climate. And some of these proxies work well in some regions, work well in some archives, and others um, don't at all. So um, you sort of have this toolkit that we, um, that, that we apply to the archive that we're interested in, to the region that we're interested in, uh, to reconstruct different aspects of climate change. Cool. So an, an archive, so, so in the case of like a sediment core, we're saying you drill a cylinder of, you know, a core, a cylinder of sediment, and then through those layers, you can measure these changes in the fossils within or the chemistry within to track evidence of climate change. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so you can think about it as that sediment accumulating over time. And so that your final, your final um, destination would be a graph on the x-axis, you have age or time, um, and then you have some temperature um, or any other climate parameter that, that you are able to measure. So you can study climate cycles or climate trends or how the different proxies and climate parameters relate to each other. There's all sorts of fun stuff you can do. So one of the best examples and sort of foundational examples of um, a paleoclimate archive and proxy are from um, foraminifera, which are these single-celled organisms that live all over the ocean and they produce these shells made out of calcium carbonate. So when they die, um, even if they were living at the surface of the ocean, these shells sink to the bottom of the ocean and are deposited in the marine sediment over millions and millions of years. So then we can go and take a sediment core from the bottom of the ocean. Uh, we look through that core, we pick out the foram shells from the sediment. And you can not only look at the changes in the species of the foram through time, um, but you can also measure the oxygen and carbon isotopes from the shells themselves. And these are indicative of, um, of global temperature and ice volume, and then the carbon isotopes can, can tell you a lot about the, the, um, the carbon cycle. And so this is sort of this foundational, um, this, this breakthrough in paleoclimatology that happened, and a lot, a lot of work has been done on forams um, for the field of paleoclimatology. Um, this is how we know our glacial interglacial cycles happened, what the climate was like at the PETM. There's a lot of information that comes um, from the, these little single-celled organisms. Um, and those sorts of things, these geochemical um, tracers or isotopes can tell you a lot about um, different aspects of climate. They're just like an infinite number of tiny little time capsules. Yeah, itty bitty fi fossils, but kind of a big deal when it comes to understanding our climate. Yeah, absolutely. And you can look at the species. You can, today, this species lives in very cold water and it lived um, at this latitude at this time. That can tell you a lot about the climate as well. Yeah. I think we, we often talk about having to use, you know, indirect evidence when in paleontology that, you, you know, you don't find a predatory dinosaur biting a prey item you have to go by the teeth uh, but climate sounds like it's even more so you, you don't find the patterns like the the uh rainfall pattern in the sediment you find evidence of heavier rainfall right there's no fossilized bank with a screen that tells you what the temperature was yeah, exactly. at that time you have to look for like chemical or you know, other secondary evidence that would have happened if it were that temperature yeah, and there are some more direct evidence of, um, for instance, at the PETM, there's palm tree uh, and crocodile fossils at the poles. So that's like, that crocodile was there. There's a, yes. there's a, a whale um, bone found in um, the lake system that I work in, in East Africa. And it's like, we know that the ocean was connected to this lake system at this time. So there are sort of more direct measures of climate, I guess, but they often are these sort of um, pinpoint events rather than a, you know, yeah, a geochemical time series um, of climate change. That, that's a good point. Yeah. If you have this thing here that could only live here if 
a certain set of climates were here, that's pretty uh, uh, definite evidence that you had one of those climates. And that's that's a really good point. And of course, species change through time, so there's there's work sort of narrowing in what uh, what the climate could be then. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the PETM, and so for our listeners, that is the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. And if you want to hear, it will very likely be mentioned a couple more times on this episode. Um, And if you want to hear more about that, check out episode 103. Are there, so obviously there's a whole bunch of different proxies we can use, plants and forams and animals. Are there certain types of environments or depositional sites that as a paleoclimatologist, you see, you know, you hear someone has discovered a new site and you go, oh, goody, goody, goody climate data. Like you mentioned lakes, you know, uh, and we talked in episode 112 about caves, how mm-hmm. caves are a great source of information over time. Are there like, what is a paleoclimatologist's favorite yeah, is there type a, of fossil site? Is there an ideal type of location? That's such a good question. And there is no answer. So, <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's complicated. Every type of archive in every region has its pros and cons. So if you study a stalagmite from a cave or a speleothem, we call them, um, you can get with um, with radioactive uh, dating techniques, you can get extremely precise age control on um, on that archive, which is great when you want to know what climate was like at a specific time. But you also have the trouble that it's it can be very difficult to extract information from that specific system. What are the water isotopes really telling you? I'm going to make people angry by saying that. But um, <laughs> everything has its pluses and minuses. So I study both ocean and lake sediment cores. I study lake cores because they are right next to these hominin fossil sites so that that regional aspect is there. They are collecting climate data from the very location that Homo erectus was living at the time of of deposition of the sediment deposition. Um, that's how, pretty cool. Yeah. So that's really cool. Um, but because it's a lake, it it doesn't it hasn't been accumulating sediment over twenty million years. So. You can get a very nice high resolution climate record from a lake sediment core, but you can't get a very, very long record. So then I also I also look at uh, marine sediment cores where I can reconstruct climate over the last 25 million years. Um, you're not going to get quite as good spatial or temporal um, sampling resolution, which is something that I'm very focused on to look at to look uh, for these climate cycles. But there's pros and cons of sort of every um, every type of archive and every type of proxy, and so we often try to combine efforts and use um, use the the strengths of of each. Yeah, try to find as much overlap between the various archives and and proxies that you can pull from to add to the resolution. Yeah, to add to the resolution. I mean. The project that I'm talking about in East Africa, I mean, it's a series of six long drill cores from Paleo Lake basins. And and we have thrown every environmental and climatic uh, proxy at these the single uh, or six different lake cores. Um, and so we're reconstructing rainfall, C3, C4 vegetation, the pollen assemblages, the phytoliths in there. We're, we're reconstructing really so many different aspects of climate to get a broad picture, a really complete picture of what the environment was doing at that given time. I will say, I know you guys are paleontologists. Often paleoclimatologists aren't sort of searching, their research questions aren't about reconstructing a habitat or, um, or a specific fossil site. That happens to be some, um, overlap of what I do, but, um, for instance, my work in the in the marine sediment core that is more generally looking at uh, Earth's climate and the effects of global climate on tropical terrestrial um, environments over time. Right, you 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 have a, a broader vision than oftentimes. You know, we we talk a lot about our work. We talk a lot about the Great Fossil Site mm-hmm. because it's the fossil site we are familiar with, and a lot of the questions we ask about this fossil site are very specific. This pond, this part of the world, these animals, these plants, this ecosystem. Right. Zoomed in. 
which for somebody like yourself, a researcher who is focused on these climate climatological questions, would you 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 might say that's really really cool. Can I get several more fossil sites and several more data points to combine into a bigger picture? Yeah, exactly. Very so it, it sounds like a lot of paleoclimatology, just like, you know, we've talked about this, at least as far back as episode 12, I have been <laughs> stressing the point that so much that, of what we know about the past comes from multiple avenues of study and multiple sources of information. It can be really easy when we look at scientific information, uh, especially looking from the outside, and even, you know, us looking into paleoclimatology, which is not our specialty, it can be very easy to get the idea that you know, we're we're hinging all of our information on one line of evidence or one yeah. particular thing, whereas that's not the case at all. It's many, many different sources of information building and corroborating each other to give us this more holistic view. Absolutely. We we are all for these multi-proxy records. Yeah. That that actually makes me think of a question. Uh, cause something else we, we like to emphasize is every fossil site is its own beast. You know, it, the sediments different, how you dig, when you can dig, how you handle the fossils, you know, how delicate or robust or what's fossilized changes basically every. You can't generalize, you know, fossil sites in Germany are like this, you know, is that similar where like a lake core from one site and a lake core from another site, are they, do they have to be handled almost completely differently because of how they preserved? Can you, you know, is it typical that you can do the similar tests because they're both lakes or is it often that they're just uh, very, very different situations? Yeah. I mean, that depends on the proxy a lot of the time. Um, but there is a lot of work that goes into studying a site before coring it. So you want to know where the deepest part is, where you can get the best archive from your drilling expedition. Um, so there's that kind of sort of pre-trip uh, homework that you do. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, scoping it out. You scope it out. You, yeah, right. You often might go and take a little core from the edge of the lake or, or something before you go and, you know, spend a million dollars and drill. Um, <laughs> but there's all sorts of different scales of these sort of archive extractions uh, or coring expeditions. But, um, and then in terms of proxy, um, for instance, I work on these um, these organic compounds, and they are um, preserved in a lot of lakes. They're sort of um, they're ubiquitous to an extent, and and that is definitely a, a pro of that proxy. Um, but often you can't get as detailed um, environmental reconstruction or lake chemistry reconstruction um, because of that. So there's definitely yeah, there's pros and cons of of each thing. Yeah. All right, so yeah, you might find a fossil site that 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 could be a place you want to core, but then once you scope it out, it turns out it might not be worth doing a long core, and maybe you go looking somewhere else. Right, if you're really interested in the last glacial maximum and what um, what the climate was at that uh, location at that time, and then you sort of scope it out, and you realize that the sediment wasn't actually preserved or it wasn't accumulating back to 20,000 years ago. Um, then you might want to find probably a larger lake system um, next door or, yeah. Interesting. Cool. Now, you have been uh, talking a bit about your own research. Is there anything else you want to tell us about what you specifically do I mean, uh, of course. in researching? <laughs> of course, of course there is. <laughs> please, please go on for at least a couple minutes about <laughs> the things that you do. Min minutes, not hours. Okay. Just, <laughs> for now. Okay, just minutes. So stay tuned for the follow up to this episode. Which will just be <laughs> Rachel talking for an entire day. About <laughs> just read us your papers. Yeah. Oh God. Um, <laughs> so I, I guess I, I've given a pretty big introduction to the archives. These like these sediment cores that I work on. These lake and ocean sediment cores. Um, but the proxy that I use, or the set of proxies, are called biomarkers. Um, they're organic compounds produced by living things. And these um, biomarkers are preserved in these sediment archives, um, whether they are produced on land and then washed into the lake or blown into the lake or the ocean or produced in uh, the water column, for instance. I study a wide range of these biomarkers that can tell us about precipitation, about vegetation, about fire history, about human presence on a landscape. Um, so there are these really powerful tools that are also 
um, very resilient. So they hang out, they hang around in the sediment for a long time. Uh, so we can, we can uh, reconstruct how much it rained 25 million years ago. So they're a really powerful tool um, for that. I mainly focus on leaf waxes. So these are waxes that are produced by plants um, to prevent from evaporation as well as physical damage um, and protect their, their softer tissue. As I said, they're very resilient. And so even if the plant um, dies and, and degrades away, these waxes are preserved um, at the bottom of the watershed, whether that be a lake or an ocean. Um, people, people have have extracted them from other archives as well, which is pretty cool. But so these, these leaf waxes are comprised of hydrocarbon chains. So you have hydro, hydrogens and carbons in the molecules that make, make up uh, the leaf waxes. And that means that you can study both the hydrogen isotopes as well as the carbon isotopes from the plants that were living on the landscape. The hydrogen isotopes tell us about the precipitation it's the H2O from the water cycle. And the carbon isotopes tell us about what type of plant was actually producing that wax. So whether that be in, in, in the tropical African region, which I'm focusing on, that's, that's generally trees versus grasslands. Um, and that then can tell us a huge amount of information about um, the habitats that our early human ancestors were living in um, uh, and more. So a, a lot of, uh, this is kind of, uh, we've talked about this in the past, there was a theme throughout paleontology that there's a lot of chemistry involved. <laughs> uh, and we don't have to go into too much detail, because obviously there's tons of detail to go into. But when we're looking at these isotopes, essentially what you're looking at is that the composition of hydrogen or carbon, or in other cases, oxygen or nitrogen or whatever it is you're studying, are going to be affected by the local temperature or local precipitation in ways that we understand by studying it today. Exactly. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's definitely correct. So in terms of hydrogen isotopes, which are my favorite, um, <laughs> you get uh, water evaporating over the ocean, the sort of initial um, cloud vapor, and that moves over land. And we know that the heavier deuterium isotopes are removed from the system more easily um, than the lighter hydrogen isotopes, which stay in the vapor stage uh, more readily. So when it when you uh, move that cloud over land, it goes through all these different um, uh, storm events. That final rainfall that you get is going to be um, much more skewed towards the light hydrogen um, than heavy hydrogen um, signature. And that is what's preserved in the leaf waxes. And so uh, we, me we can measure if we get a more negative signature three million years ago, we can understand that it probably rained a lot more in the late Pliocene than today or, or whether we're, you know, reconstructing climate over that whole time period. We can look for uh, cycles in, um, and trends in the amount of rainfall. It's stuff like this where you can start to understand the mentality that of people who will hear scientific information and go kind of like, ah, really? Yeah. Because <laughs> it does, after a while, it does start to feel almost like soothsaying, right? It's like, <laughs> yes, I can read the molecules and yeah. know all this incredible information. Or like the and of course, overly complex mystery novels. <laughs> right, exactly. But of course, this is grounded in observations we yeah. have today. Right. Just going into this complex climatological chemistry and it's amazing that we can get to the end of it and i, I say all you have to do as though it's simple <laughs> but really at the end you can go yeah this is the hydrogen that was left behind and with all of this information we have behind that we can say yeah here's how much it rained yeah when we plug that into the the history of data sets that we've built up it comes up with this answer and i i, I like it I like this because it, to me, once again, like climate affecting climate reemphasizes the interconnectedness of everything that yeah, leaf wax is one of those things that most people don't even consider to be a thing. I, like, I have not considered it very much. Yeah. Like uh, many of us are familiar with it. It's why they're all shiny and whatnot. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> but you don't think about it being a thing that has physical properties that are affected by where that plant grew and what it had to build with. And so an unassuming thing that can give us so much information is very cool. But then, yeah, 
it's everything is affected. The clouds coming in and dropping off one isotope to then rain another isotope. It's uh, it's very cool. Yeah, and you're absolutely right that we have modern data sets. So we collect rainfall monthly rainfall, and then we can study the isotopes in that rainfall, but we can also study the, the leaf waxes in each of those months experiencing that rainfall. And so we can get a good idea of what season is it biased towards and, um, and how much rain corresponds to this isotope value and stuff like that. That in and of itself, the isotope to millimeters per rainfall, that gets quite complicated, especially when you're thinking 3 million years ago. And so something that I do in my research is not necessarily say this is how much it rained at this time, but I'm looking for patterns in a time series. So looking for um, those cycles um, that are caused by the Earth's orbit around the sun, looking for trends that might be caused by uh, the closing of a certain seaway that we know happened 4 million years ago and things like that. So we're, I'm sort of looking at the relative changes in these isotope systems um, to not overinterpret, because you definitely don't you don't want to do that. Yeah, right. it, it could be t- it could be tempting to want to give a, a a weekly weather report for what this lake was like. But you're looking more for was it raining more than it was here? Was it raining less and more and less and more? Right. And we can find a cycle to it, or this dip or rise corresponds with something else that we suspected might have an effect. Right. And a lot of my research in Africa has been to compare these patterns of climate change with human evolution. So we have questions about what aspects of the climate have affected evolutionary, um, you know, new species, new species or uh, migrations out of Africa or new stone tool technology. So I'm, I'm the one who produces the climate record. And I I work with paleoanthropologists, but we work together to make these um, comparisons between climate and these evolutionary changes um, to understand sort of, you know, what is driving human evolution? Did rainfall even have anything to do with it? Or was it the the expansion of C4 grasslands that 10 million years ago, you know? Very cool. I have one more question, uh, and then we should move on to other things. How do you find fossilized leaf wax (laughs) biomolecules in the fossil record? Yeah, so you can't see them with your naked eye. Um, We take an aliquot of sediment from a sediment core, and we basically run it through an espresso machine. We we, uh, pump it up to really high temperature and pressure and run organic solvents through the sediment. And this is going to extract all sorts of organic compounds. Then we do a series of, um, of, of lab steps in our organic chemistry lab um, to isolate the compounds that we want. And we ultimately run them on an instrument that, that has all these diagnostic uh, tools. So we know, we do know that they are leaf waxes, right? We know the specific, um, the distributions of the waxes. We know how that, that molecule um, behaves when we, when we break it apart, things like that. So That's another thing that this whole field of um, organic geochemistry is allowing us to uh, search out uh, new proxies. So I know it's it's hard to sort of relate to uh, how how did anyone even find a leaf wax in the first place? But there we have these tools. um, And if you start seeing patterns in them, you can do some tests and see if if it's related to um, to climate change. And that happens all the time. There's papers um, published all the time with new uh, new proxies for different aspects of climate. Something might be controlled by both temperature and uh, lake water pH or something. And so then there's different techniques to, to, um, to separate out those two uh, p- climate parameters to do some, some deeper digging. I like that you made the point that uh... We know how you know you you know and people who work <laughs> with them know how leaf waxes respond chemically, like right. you know, and that's why you're able to chemically extract it with these processes. You know, so it's not just that you're running it through a bunch of tests and then getting a result and going must be leaf wax. Exactly. Only leaf wax will come out because of the steps we did because we know 
chemically how it behaves. It's like when you dye a specimen. Yeah. You put a dye in and that dye will only adhere to certain tissues yeah, or we, something like that. We've designed it that way. Right. Yeah, exactly. And and we even, we do this series of isolating steps and then we still look on this sort of diagnostic instrument to make sure that that's what the isotopes are that we're measuring. Wow. Well, I, th- th- this is fascinating and I would love for you to talk about this all day, as long as you want to. <laughs> but we should continue because uh, we want to start talking about the history of climate. So we've been talking about climate in the broad sense. What is it? How do we study it? After we take a short break, let's start making our way through some of the changes that have happened in Earth's history and see how, how did we get to where we are today? So one of the things that is difficult about studying major systems and, and, you know, major changes in things like climate on Earth is that, as the the, the phrase goes, we only have one Earth. (laughs) There's no backup Earth. There's no second Earth. We can't have another planet that we can run experiments on. And when that comes up, I always love to fall back on one of the best things about geology and paleontology is that we actually do have an extraordinary assortment of case studies for climate change in the geologic record. The Earth is four and a half billion years old, and climate has shifted throughout that whole time. So before we go into some specifics, Rachel, can you give us a sense of what has climate change looked like over the course of Earth history? Okay, I'm going to give like the most basic overview of what I know Earth did (laughs) over the last four and a half billion years. The spark notes of spark notes. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So, I mean, the Earth was first formed and it was molten. And so it was obviously very, very hot. And even during, you know, millions and millions of years following, it's much hotter than it was today. You know, cycling through, cycling through millions and billions of years, there's always been a balance as we talked about between tectonics and climate. Um, And so there was a lot of, there's a lot of long-term cyclicity in the last four and a half uh, billion years. Um, There have been some some hot houses, um, like the most recent one, the PETM, like we talked about, um, that's more than 10 degrees Celsius, warmer than today. Um, There's also been What's, what are called snowball earths, which is pretty much what it sounds like when it, the whole surface is covered uh, in ice. Um, and this is thought to ha- have happened about 2 billion years ago, um, um, around the start of the Great Oxidation event, um, when Earth saw its first rise in atmospheric oxygen. Um, Episode 75. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, this this also coincides with the first eukaryotes, which like which like... You guys can talk way more about than I can. <laughs> there's a, there's sort of a, a joke in intro geology or earth systems classes that this this great oxidation event um, was followed by what's called the boring billion. So there's, yep. <laughs> there's relative climate stasis during that time, although I'm always on the side of more data will tell you that there's more climate variability than you thought. So... Right. You know, it's it's very difficult to study climate two billion years ago, but but people people attempt it um, heroically. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had these broad scale shifts, right? We've had glaciations, we've had hot houses, we've had snowball events, which is ridiculous. That, that's <laughs> like we're, we were hoth, we were hoth for a little bit there. I get that reference. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually been to hoth. I've been to that <gasps> research station in Norway. <gasps> Wow. Yeah. Oh, you're our coolest guest. No offense to everyone else. That's <laughs> awesome. For the sake of our uninitiated listeners, they are now talking about Star Wars. <laughs> Hoth is the planet that is featured at the beginning of The Empire Strikes Back, where Luke has to go inside of a Tauntaun. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, in addition to these broad scale shifts, uh, there will there are going to be minor shifts over time, like you're talking about in your research studying climate in specific areas. So let's zoom in a bit and get more towards, I think, some of the questions that uh, paleoclimatologists are generally all interested in. And that is, when climate changes, there is, there's got to always be a cause and an effect. Right? Climate doesn't just change randomly. 
you know, <laughs> and I'll hear people, people will say, oh, climate has changed all throughout Earth history. Uh, climate is always changing. And yes, but there's always a reason why the climate changes. Yeah, there's a why. There right. is a cause. Uh, and you used the word earlier in the episode, forcers, which I think is the common term that climatologists use. That, forcings, yeah. Or forcings. So can you talk a bit about what do we know about what causes climate to change? Uh, what do we know about what happens when it does? And please feel free to use specific examples of cool climate events from the past or hot climate events from the past. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I, I do want to just point out that the more recent in time we study, the easier it is to collect data. So that's why we have instrumental records from the past 150 years. Um, but it's a lot easier to study uh, the Pleistocene than it is the Oligocene, for, in for instance, um, or the PETM. So sort of the closer we get to today, the more data is available because there are simply more, pro more archives um, available that cover those time periods. That's the similar issue with general fossils. The farther you go back, the worse the resolution gets. Exactly. Um, but on those long, longer time scales, and we've talked, we've touched on this in the episode already, but tectonics, including mountain building events, seaways and other and volcanoes, other things, um, these are sort of boundary conditions um, and they can have major controls on temperature by way of CO2 variability, atmospheric and oceanic circulation that are driven by changes in topography, bathymetry. Uh, rock weathering, that kind of thing. So th these are what I think of as sort of directional, um, maybe processes that happen over millions of years. On finer time scales, and when I say fine time scales, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of years. So you know, still pretty long time <laughs> periods. But those are sort of the the time periods that I um, that I often think about. Um, and our Earth's orbit around the Sun and its ch the changes in that orbit drive many, many aspects of the world we live in. Um, for instance, the tilt of the Earth's axis. Um, this affects uh, temperatures in the poles. When it's at a more acute angle, you're going to get more extreme temperatures. You're going to get colder, colder colds and warmer warms at the poles. If you think about sort of this merry-go-round, if you're on a merry-go-round and you're on the outside, you're, you're feeling that spin uh, more than you are if you're, than if you're sitting on the inside. And so when you think about the difference between the poles and the tropics, that tilt is going to affect the poles more than it's going to affect the tropics. Um, so if you change that tilt, the tropics sort of stay uh, in place, whereas the poles are sort of getting whipped around. Right, because the poles are leaning either closer to or farther from the sun right right as we go around it and, and when it's summertime the f your hemisphere is leaning towards the sun and so the more lean there is the more it's going to affect those poles the ones that are effectively closest to the source of yeah. the heat exactly and that uh cycle i mean we we know uh through physics the and astrophysics the um the cycle that 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 changes on, and that's about forty thousand years. Um, and so, if we have you know climate reconstructions over the last three million years, we can start to pick up these forty thousand year cycles in in polar climate. Um, there's other aspects of Earth's orbit, like the eccentricity or the the circularity of Earth's orbit around the sun. That changes and that affects um, affects sort of the extremes and lengths of uh, seasons. Um, and we also have the the precession of the equinoxes or the 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 wobble in Earth's axis, and we know these cycles. Eccentricity is a hundred thousand years. Precession is twenty thousand years. About, um, and so we can we can reconstruct these with our paleoclimate records. And I imagine that those cycles. So are those Milankovitch cycles? Yes. Okay, so that's the term. I have my term right. Yeah. <laughs> so these orbital shifts over time. Those I often hear come up in reference to the Pleistocene. Yes. So the Pleistocene epoch is the last two and a half or so million years during which there has been this warming, cooling, warming, cooling cycle. So can you talk a bit more about 
how those cycles are related to Pleistocene glacial cycles. Yeah, this is really interesting. And I, I did, we did touch on this before where we were talking about the high northern latitudes. So mm-hmm. the amount of solar radiation that I mean, we use 65 degrees north, but it's really like the northern Atlantic region, the amount of solar radiation that is experienced at that in that region has all sorts of effects. So when you get more insulation there or solar radiation, you might melt the ice caps. That's going to um, that's going to contribute fresh water to the North Atlantic Ocean. It's going to prevent um, deep water formation at that site, which is going to slow uh, ocean circulation and heat transport throughout the globe. And that's going to have all sorts of effects, effects on, um, I mean, tropical precipitation is what I'm interested in. <laughs> but it has all sorts of effects on the, on the carbon cycle, on um, greenhouse gas um, absorption by the ocean and all sorts of effects. So it's that solar radiation at that specific latitude that's really driving a lot of, um, of global climate. And so, right, so the Pleistocene is this really cool um, example because tectonics likely were driving this very gradual cooling. It seems that around 3 million years ago, the Earth became cool enough to sustain these high northern latitude ice sheets, the Greenland ice sheet. And when that happened, um, these orbital cycles, which have been happening the whole time, right? It's not just that they the, the Earth started moving in relation <laughs> to the sun and the Pleistocene, but the ice sheet that was, um, that was permanently there in the high northern latitudes sort of amplified the effects of the orbital cycles. And so you start to see... Um, a 41,000 year glacial interglacial cycle that's directly related to obliquity about you move through time at about 1 million years ago you reach an event called the mid pleistocene transition where these glacial interglacial cycles um, became much more extreme and also not instead of being a 41,000 year cycle they were they started um, being driven by the 100,000 year cycle so there's this nature of, um, of change in those cycles, and that is also likely due to the long, long-term cooling of the globe. That's fascinating, yeah. and it answers a question that I had never consciously thought until you mentioned it, which is when you look at these climate reconstructions over time, especially the Cenozoic, when mm-hmm. they zoom in on the last 60 million years or so, you see these sort of ups and downs. You see the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum is this big spike, and then right. it gradually goes down over the course of the Cenozoic, and then it becomes a heartbeat monitor. Yeah, at the end, right? It's the up and down of the Pleistocene. And I, I guess I had always wondered, but never realized why all of a sudden it starts bouncing up right. and down. But it's, it sounds like it's that we reached a specific Earth condition that allowed those cycles to take over. Uh, climate force yeah more aggressively yeah it's sort of this amplifier um yeah i mean it's interesting because there are there are cycles prior to the pleistocene in the pliocene we see um we see what some people call glacial interglacial cycles but they're really not extreme glaciated times um but they but climate is responding um but throughout throughout Earth's history, different regions have been responsible for contributing more or less to global climate. And certainly in the Pleistocene, the, the high northern latitudes have a really large effect on what happens on the whole planet. It's it's kind of crazy to think like because when you're dealing with global climate change, of course, you have to look at the planet. You know, you can't just go, all right, global climate change, but North America, like right. you have to take a planetary view uh and it's the two things that stand out to me is one it's crazy that there are sweet spots like i wouldn't have thought about it's like no this latitude is really where a lot of the action gets kicked off when things change Mm -hmm. it makes sense it just i never would have thought of it and i think it's i remember the first time i learned about the variance in the earth's movements having those effects because the way the earth moves you know spinning but also around the sun has always is typically always talked about and seems like such a universally consistent thing it's static mm-hmm. it is yeah it is the way it is but not only has it do we know that it has changed like we are slowing down as as the moon 
acts like a break on us and as Intraby slowly steals energy from everything. But also there's variance. It's not consistent. It's not just ever moving. It's slightly changing. And it's just not in a way we can perceive, but it's having global effects. And yeah, that's <laughs> the way we're moving through space is having an effect on okay. these climactic shifts. And it's it's interesting too. I mean, that is such that's such a good point. It's it's wild to think about. Yeah, <laughs> our, our spaceship is act, is hitting is acting weird, and it makes the weather weird. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. And and if you if you have ever seen like a graph of glacial interglacial cycles that or heard of this sawtooth shape pattern, it's not like the ice sheets are growing and then they're wane and waxing. They're not waning and then waxing. They're growing, 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 and then in a much shorter amount of time, they are breaking up. And so oh. just the internal physics of ice is contributing to all sorts of uh, things, um, which, again, makes it very complicated. <laughs> yeah. So we've got orbital cycles are as a major climate forcing factor uh, in the more recent times. And of course, we talked about tectonic activity can contribute to it. You mentioned volcanoes. We've talked in previous episodes, specifically episode five, about rare events like asteroid impacts mm -hmm, that can have, mm -hmm. you know, influences. Are there other forces, climate ca causes of climate change that stand out for you or that have been important at certain times in the past? Yeah. So today we have a very prevalent, um, what people are now thinking of as an external climate forcing, which is anthropogenic uh, carbon dioxide. So we are digging up fossil and fossils and using them as fuels, and we are burning them, and that is um, contributing their carbon. It's combining with the oxygen in the atmosphere, and it's becoming carbon dioxide, which is a very uh, potent greenhouse gas. I'm sure you've heard about carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. Um, but so this is acting today as this sort of trigger for these downstream climate effects. Um, we've seen in the paleoclimate record um, over the past about 800,000 years, we've seen an extremely tight link between carbon dioxide and temperature. There is right. no doubt in climate scientists' mind that these two are linked. There's no doubt in physicists' minds that <laughs> these two are linked. And this is something we've brought up in previous discussions, even farther back in the record, you know, when we look at, you know, the end Cretaceous or we looked at the PETM, there is very often this link when looking at past climate change between CO2 and temperatures. Right. And we see these exactly in these past warm climates when carbon dioxide was very high, the temperature was very high. What's different about today is that we are... Um, injecting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at a rate that has absolutely never been seen before. Even those hot events like the PETM um, were generally in a steady state. Um, so if we stopped emitting carbon dioxide today, the temperature would continue to rise. It has not caught up fully to the, to the potential of carbon dioxide um, uh, forcing yet. Gotcha. So the forcer, in this case, the human releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, is happening faster than the climate can react to it. Right. As opposed to, a, you know, a slower case where everything would kind of be changing at the same rate. We've kind of thrown a bunch of CO2 up there and now the climate is working to catch up. It sounds like the climate climatological equivalent of when you hit print a bunch of times and then you have to wait <laughs> for right. it to catch up. Exactly. <laughs> but and, and also, you know, in those other time periods and in just glacial interglacial cycles, oftentimes that's given um, that's given species and populations um, of both animals and plants and all sorts of organisms time to adapt and evolve. Um, and now we're seeing a lot of extinction um, going on and and other sorts of effects like that. Right, right. So I think a big, major important part of the paleontological perspective on climate is that a lot of our information for understanding climate change today doesn't just come from that 150-year record of monitoring and, and creating models. 
it comes from this four and a half billion year record <laughs> of case studies where we can say, here's a list of the things that cause climate change, right? Orbital yeah. changes, changes in ocean circulation, changes in mountain building, tectonics, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can look at the modern world and say, okay, let's go down the list. What's happening today? Exactly. You know, what, what can account for uh, the changes that we see in the world today? Yeah. And, and, you know, a very common sort of climate denier position or, or argument is that there's always been these cycles, that climate has always, that, that, that it's been much warmer in the past than it is today, and that there are cycles um, of large amplitude. And a very famous climate science communicator, um, Catherine Hayhoe, will point out that we, climate scientists, are the ones who told you that in the first yes. place. We're <laughs> yes. the ones reconstructing climate, which is why it's so alarming that we are so alarmed. <laughs> right. It's, yeah, well, these have always been, yes, we know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and the people who study the climate changes of the past are the ones who are concerned and yeah. pointing the, out these issues with climate today. Right, exactly. I mean, we can make a simple cross plot of carbon dioxide and temperature and show, you know, I mean, you know, gets more complicated with climate models. We can do some some more detailed analyses, but they are very tightly linked. Yeah. 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 So can you talk a bit more about how we use paleoclimate information to help us understand climate change today? Yeah. So paleoclimatology um, helps us in, I, I think, in two major ways. And that is, of course, aside from our innate interest in our home's history. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, that is another benefit of paleoclimatology that I, I never want to forget. Um, but in terms of studying uh, future climate change, I see it as helping in two major ways. That is one, to study the natural cycles. We want to understand how different today's climate is from how it should be. Um, you know, if, if, we're coming out of the Holocene. It should be cooling, but it's, it's not. It's getting much, much warmer. So we can study these natural cycles to answer questions on how certain aspects of climate change in certain regions respond to certain forcings. The second major way that paleoclimatology um, helps us understand our current situation and future global warming is by validating those climate models. So the physics in a climate model are based on physical evidence and, and theory. And these are equations are run and connected together with various amounts of detail and background. And if the models can reconstruct what those proxy records, these paleoclimate records are telling us, um, maybe in certain past uh, warm periods, if a climate model can be validated to really show what the proxy records are telling us that happened in the PETM, then we can trust them more to accurately tell us, um, act accurately predict how climate will change in the future. And it's not just important in terms of past warm periods. You also want these models to, um, to reconstruct the past cold periods as well. You really want to get a sense of that climate sensitivity, which is generally thought to be um, the temperature response to a forcing. Right. So it's climate sensitivity, which is a term I hear a lot. Yeah refers to how easily can certain forces affect the climate, right? How quickly, how extremely, how intensely certain climate aspects will react to certain other changes. Yeah, and different regions can have different climate sensitivity. And it's, it doesn't have to be temperature, but yeah, um, that's, that's spot on. I like the point you made about using paleoclimate data to test our models. Because early in the episode, you made the point that we can make predictions in 1995 about the next 15 years, and then we live the next 15 years, and we can test our predictions with those models. But of course, that doesn't help us make predictions about what happens if the temperature goes up 10 degrees Celsius. Exactly. But we can turn to those paleontological case studies, those, those ancient case studies, geological uh, case studies, perhaps, and say, okay, well, we actually do have an example of when that happens, so we can test our models against that. Right, and and we often um, motivate our work exactly that way. I, I want to study the Pliocene because we know in the Pliocene, carbon dioxide levels were about 400 ppm, 
or 450 ppm, and that's where we're headed. We can go back further to the Eocene to study much, much warmer climates to see where we're headed. And again, this isn't just to look at how warm is the world going to get. It's it's to look at how rainy it's going to be in East Africa or um, when and um, at what time and at what rate are the ice sheets going to melt in this in this global warming uh, scenario that we are performing in real life. <laughs> right, right. Now, you mentioned a couple times uh, the comparison between modern climate change in the past. And oftentimes we hear that in terms of, like you said, carbon dioxide levels or temperature levels. We can say we're, we're reaching levels that are similar to these particular times in the past. Can you talk a bit about what makes the change that we're seeing? different today compared to all these examples we have throughout history. Yeah, I mean it's definitely it's definitely the rate at which it's happening and that is going to um you know we can use these past warm periods or this past um greenhouses as analogs for future warming but um a lot of these processes may not be similar because of the rate at which it's happening. That's often the issue I would run into trying to explain the the harm and dangers that and you know future issues that we're concerned with and currently facing with our climactic experiment uh that we're running to guests at the aquarium and and guests at the museum is still into a single human life it feels like what's happening is happening over a long period of time mm. but trying to explain that uh, compared to climactic shifts and uh, a- animals and plants ability to adapt to stuff it's happening very rapidly compared to even equally and more warm times in the past right. and that th- it's it's having there's not enough time for a rubber band effect for things to catch up right it, it's it's an equally fascinating and terrifying idea that the climate change we're seeing today is in many ways unprecedented yeah. in the history of our planet. Right. And you can also think of uh, the effects of climate change, like increased hurricanes on the East Coast of the United States, increased uh, wildfires and droughts in the West. You can think of these in the past, and it's really hard to reconstruct the number of hurricanes that happened in the Eocene. And so right. it's it's also just like the lack of data is really hard to to comprehend um, when we're when we're experiencing it. Um, we can use these past warm climates, and you know I'm pro paleoclimatology, but there's a lot of uncertainty um, that still exists. Right. Especially in those details, it sounds like. Exactly. Right. And this and now it's it's changing year to year. And I do think that people are starting to to remember the last decade and, and actually um understand that things are changing and, and it's scary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we are to to talk society for a bit. <laughs> uh we're in a world now where people our age and, and especially, you know, a bit younger than us, have grown up in a world where this is a major point of discussion. Yeah, this, this is, is a, news. A common conversation topic. And so we're accustomed to hearing it. Right. Uh, now, I think that uh, we've been talking about how climate changes, or talking about what causes climate to change. Obviously, one of the big reasons why climate change is such a, a hot topic, so to speak, yep. in our modern day world, in, in our discussions, isn't entirely just because of why it's happening, but because of what it might lead to. So uh, in leading up to talking about today, can you talk a little bit about what we've seen in the geologic record in terms of the effects of climate change, the after effects? What happens when the climate has changed in the past? And how does that reflect on our concerns about the future of modern day climate change? Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of the most sort of direct work on this is looking at like ice sheet melting and sea level rise and that kind of thing. Um, there's been some really nice reconstructions using foram isotopes, um, which represent ice volume. So the actual amount of ice or water locked up in ice um, at, at a certain time. Um, and you cool. can, yeah. 
and you can um, you can reconstruct um, sort of the the speed at which that changes and responds to global warming. And again, th that has all sorts of downstream effects. Um, in warm periods, a lot of people use the Pliocene as sort of um, the most direct analog. So three million years ago in the Pliocene, you had carbon dioxide levels about about what they are today. And you see, you see areas that are wet now, they're wetter then. And you see dry areas that are dry now, you see them drier then. So the wet gets wetter, the dry gets drier. Um, that's a general pattern um, that was seen in the Pliocene. You see no glacial interglacial cycles or very, very reduced glacial interglacial cycles on those types of timescales. Um, and then in terms of, of ecosystem, you see different distributions of, um, of plants on the surface. You might see in wet areas, more closed canopy um, vegetation or more, um, more uh, open vegetation in, in drier regions. Um, so these, these sort of um, regional differences are sort of exacerbated in the higher CO2 intervals. And so looking towards the future, we might be worried about areas that experience flooding now. They might, they, that might increase with um, stronger, uh, more sudden uh, rainstorm events or thunderstorm events. Um, and, and in the Southwest, we've already started to see, in the Southwest of the United States, we've already started to see um, really extreme uh, and longer droughts. Um, and people use all, all sorts of different paleoclimate archives. People are looking at um, tree rings to, to, to um, analyze interannual variability responses to um, climate forcings and, and all sorts of stuff. And we've talked throughout this episode about how climate shifts in different areas can be different. Different parts of the, the planet, different ecosystems, different regions can experience different kinds of changes, which makes it very difficult to anticipate future shifts in the plants in a, in a specific region, the animals in a specific region. One thing that I often think about, uh, coming from this sort of very animal-focused perspective that Will and I typically have, mm -hmm. is that... When a change happens in one area, like Will, you mentioned before, regions are not bordered by yeah. hard lines. Right. You know, if one region becomes inhospitable for certain species of plants or animals, they're not just going to stand in one place and die. They're going to move. They're going to move somewhere else. If one region experiences increased precipitation, well, that's going to increase, you know, flow of water into the next region or something like that. That all these changes can interact in very mm -hmm. complex ways. Yeah, and a part of my research is is studying what aspects of climate have have an effect on human evolution. So our species, our early human ancestors, um, and what we're finding is that these smaller, these finer scale cycles. So these these high amplitude, rapid, abrupt changes in climate are really what affect. Um, humans and other, you know, large mammals. So it's not necessarily these long-term changes, but these, these short-term changes that kept, catch them off guard, make them um, move to a different region um, suddenly. And that is also something that I, I think about in terms of future global warming. We're, we're seeing that, you know, in paleoclimate research, if, if rapid climate changes that were much slower than they are today, if those are having a big effect on, um, on animal populations, then it's just going to be um, exacerbated in the future. Wow. That, that makes sense. Uh, even though it, it typically is portrayed that, you know, shorter time scale things are too brief or too fleeting to have the long-term effects as like a gradual, you know, it's slowly getting colder. So things are slowly evolving along with the colder temperatures or, you know, a dying or adapting. Uh, but it does make sense that dramatic shifts would have to have effect on behavior or where you can live for potentially long enough for changes to happen. Yeah. Or what survives for you to eat. Yeah. What you right. now are, <laughs> what your roommates are in your habitat <laughs> has shifted because of the last little blip. Right. Interesting. And the idea is that um, the longer term changes can have a larger effect on morphological changes in a species, but that more abrupt uh, short term changes 
can, as you sa said, have a, a big effect on behavior um, and culture even um, in terms of humans. So you might see a new new stone tool technology. I'm just, I'm drawing um, examples from my own research, but yeah. these, mm -hmm. these behavioral changes, evolution doesn't have um, the time to uh, to keep up with um, these really abrupt changes. So yeah, for your genome to, right, exactly. to, to adapt. So you'd have to start a bit doing things differently. Yeah. Right. Or you go extinct. Yeah, or you die. Yeah. Or you go extinct. Exactly. And that and I don't think it's a coincidence that Homo sapiens are the only um the only Homo species still living. We're very adaptable. We're very good with technology as we record this podcast on our computers <laughs> and our microphones. Um, we had very, very advanced culture and uh, we can think long term. Um, and these are all parts that make us human, homo sapiens. And um, and we survived all of these really extreme climate changes and we we dispersed all over the world. I mean, we have people living in Antarctica. Yeah. Well, I, I like it because it, it also we can see parallels to what you're describing in the way humans are shifting things, not just climactically, but environmentally and landscape wise, like a lot of the animals that are successfully surviving are behaviorally adaptable animals, raccoons and crows, hmm. animals that can, we, we built a building where your forest was and they go, okay, I'll make this work. I can nest on that. I will start behaving like a city raccoon yeah. now. And I, I will learn to look both ways before I cross the street, which forest raccoons don't know how to do. And like, you can see that that's not just a human thing, but there are animals who might, we might also see the, the, the successors during right. this climactic uh, catastrophe might be the ones who can behaviorally change quicker than others. Would you, would you say that those are more generalist species? Is that like yeah. a term? Oh, yeah. Okay. Definitely. Well, we've talked in the past about how there are trends during major shifts in Earth history. We, this comes up in our extinction episodes very commonly. Mm -hmm. When a Because as we've discussed, an extinction isn't just that a volcano went off and all the dinosaurs burned yeah, to yeah. death. Everyone that got hit by lava died. Right. It's that <laughs> the global ecosystem was disrupted. And so there are certain trends that you see in which sorts of life tend to survive those. Uh, animals and, and species that need more resources tend not to do okay. You know, the larger you are, the bigger your territory, the more food you need. Whereas generalists or very adaptable right. species seem to do much better. And it does lead you to wonder, you know, what what are we going to see as we move forward? How How is our current circumstance going to compare to the major rapid changes we've seen in the past. And my studies with paleoclimate and paleoanthropology have definitely suggested that these these dramatic abrupt changes select for more generalists mm -hmm. that are able to live in a, a wide variety of environments. Which makes sense. Yep, makes yeah. perfect sense. Right. If, if I'm only comfortable at this temperature with this much rain and eating this specific plant, yep. then when any of that changes, that makes it a lot harder for them to, yep. <laughs> to roll with the punches. Right. Now, before we wrap up our climate and paleoclimate discussion, uh, it can it can get we've run into this in certain discussions in the past when we've talked about modern extinctions and we've talked about reefs. Our reef episode did this. Yeah. Topics like this can get kind of depressing. Yeah. It can feel kind of uh, a little ominous. Right. <laughs> so as a climate expert, uh, Rachel, could you c give us some uplifting uh, thoughts about the <laughs> modern uh, climate change? Because it's not all doom and gloom, right? There there. are. Are, we are making progress. Yeah. I mean, so climate anxiety is a real thing that people experience in a, in a, in a, in a variety of, of, to different extents. Um, but yeah, a doom and gloom attitude is, is not going to solve this problem and certainly could lead to inaction and inaction is definitely not the answer. So the sooner we change our ways, the better. But it's really important to, to remember that anything we do now will be beneficial down the road. So any amount that we reduce our emissions or any act, climate activism that we participate in will have, will have benefits down the road. 
I think what I, what's, what's been most exciting to me to see are these huge youth driven movements. Um, if you haven't heard of the sunrise movement, definitely check them out. They're doing amazing, um, activism work, um, policy work. They help draft the Green New Deal. Um, and politicians now are really starting to listen. We're getting, you know, younger, more climate progressive politicians all over the world understanding that this is not a problem for that small island in the Pacific that's going to sink. This is a real global problem, and we have a huge responsibility to tackle it. Um, so I, I think what gives me the most hope is seeing, you know, I'm a climatologist. I've been, I think about the climate every day, and I've done mm -hmm. so for 10 years. And so it's sometimes hard for me to even, to even, um, tell what others are thinking about it, but it does seem in the past couple years, especially that it is, I mean, it was in the presidential debates for the first time. It is really a, a, um, a, a big ticket, um, discussion point. And the more that we talk about it, the better. Those are all great points. And I think the one that's really stood out to me, as you said, what we do today will have impacts down the road. And I, and, you know, we're geologi geologically minded. We're yep. used to thinking in the long term. And I think that it's important to think in the long term, not only for the impacts, not only to think, yeah, what we're doing today is going to cause problems, not for our generation necessarily, but for the next generation. But that's a great point that it's also important to think in that same long term in terms of benefits, in terms of positive change that the positive changes we make today, even if we don't see the... The, the fruits of those labors. Exactly, the, the ultimate benefits of those. Right. Knowing that those are just as assured as the opposite. Yeah. Right, yeah. Wait, I, I also like the point you made about climactic, you know, climate change anxiety c can kind of halt you in your tracks. And I kind of want to piggyback on it that I've also seen it do the opposite of if you get to doom and gloom, it can... It can turn people against wanting to help because it it's you're it seems like you're overreacting. As soon as you're like, We're we're gonna end the planet. All right, well we're not. The earth's we're earth's not going to explode because it gets too hot. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you start leaning too far into that, you could actually turn people off from wanting to listen or help. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it, the situation is dire, but treating it factually is always better than trying to amp up the doom and gloom, both for your sanity and to right. w when explaining it to others. And I, I definitely have, you know, friends that are climate scientists that have this real, I mean, they're doing the measurements and they have real climate anxiety. And I, I think it is a valid, valid feeling. And I am all for that self-care to take a break from your <laughs> from your research, or your activism, um, your, your political outreach um, to reset so that we can just get back to work and, and be more effective down the road. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the mindset of doing what you can. Yes. Yeah. You know, do what you can. But at, once it starts feeling overwhelming, you're not going to help anybody by working yourself into a spiral of depression or being overwhelmed or something. So yeah. You have can, to do what you can because you can't do it all. Right. It can be very easy to get overwhelmed and to think, all right, I got to start. I got to do recycling and I got to get an electric right. car and I got to eat less meat and I got to do all these things. But taking it in the pieces that you can handle. Yeah. And, and it's great to see different people, um, you know, use their strengths. You guys are um, science communicators and you're spreading a lot of really interesting and accurate and um, great information to a wide range of people. While that may not be my strength, I'm like, I'm in lab studying past climate change so that uh, we can understand the importance of future global warming. And so we're all using our, our special set of skills to um, work together to tackle this. Yeah, yeah. We didn't tell her to say that. <laughs> that was a very, that was a spontaneous, very sweet thing to say. Uh, do you have any resources that you could share with our listeners for people who are interested in either learning more or doing more? What are some of your favorite resources? Yeah, so I, I would definitely, okay, first of all, I would just read the Green New Deal. 
<laughs> it is not that long. So read that. It's online. There's a really great podcast called How to Save a Planet. Um, it is put on by Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, who is this wonderful, um, she's actually an oceanographer, um, but she is a wonderful climate science communicator and, and policy um, expert. So, and, and just amazing to listen to. She has a pod, that podcast with Alex Bloomberg. Um, so that's really wonderful to listen to. And if you're, if you're interested in doing like outreach and activism, um, check out the Sunrise Movement. It's this youth-led organization. I've contributed money to them. I mean, there's all sorts of different ways to help out. Um, and there, that's the group that, that really drove um, this Green New Deal um, sort of initial draft a few years ago. Um, I would definitely recommend, I know I already mentioned Catherine Hayhoe, but her um, YouTube series called Global Weirding has these really wonderful informational um, episodes, sort of not necessarily talking about global warming, but how our um, our Earth is just getting weirder. Uh, and she's just an amazing uh, science communicator. And if you just go to like nasa.com, NOAA, N-O-A-A.com, they have really great educational resources and like very clear um, diagrams and uh, and explainers for for certain aspects of the climate system. Great, and we will put links to all that in the blog post. Yes. So, listeners, if you didn't write that down, uh, check out the blog post, <laughs> and we'll have all that for all of you not taking notes. Wait. <laughs> Wait, you weren't taking notes? Yeah, right? There's going to be a quiz at the end of the podcast. <laughs> what is climate? Yes. Right. <laughs> well, five years? Sorry. This, yeah. <laughs> this has been a really excellent discussion. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for giving us all, all this information and all these insights. We are going to move towards the end of the podcast, but before we do, there is one more thing to, uh, to put an end note on our climate discussion, we have a patron question. Mm -hmm. One of the things that our patrons on Patreon can do at a certain level is ask us questions to answer on the podcast. And as I mentioned in previous episodes, every now and then we have a question that is just perfectly suited for a certain episode. And we have a question related to climate that we would love to hear your answer to. Thanks to Michael, who says... My understanding is that during the Pleistocene, the glaciation occurred in cycles with warmer interglacials in between. And yes, correct, Michael, as we've talked about. Warming is considered a possible cause for the megafaunal extinction during the most recent interglacial, which is also true. We talked about that in episode 25. Michael's question is, is there any evidence for mass declines or extinctions during previous interglacials? So during that up and down warming cooling cycle of the Pleistocene, do we see changes? Do we see extinctions during previous warming periods? Yeah, this is a great question. And I did a little digging for you, Michael. Um, so it seems like there isn't actually great evidence for mass declines across um, other Pleistocene glacial to interglacial transitions, which sort of answers this question um, of was it climate change that drove that extinction or was it um, human overkill? So we know that humans, um, like Homo sapiens, dispersed throughout North America um, a, a significantly during the last interglacial. That is likely because uh, the ice sheet retreated and the Bering Strait opened up and other uh, land, uh, land masses to, to disperse along the, the coast of North America occurred. So as, as I think we've we've touched on, Homo sapiens can be rather destructive, <laughs> <laughs> and and could have had a really really um, sad impact on the megafauna in the in the last interglacial. And so, whether it is directly caused by warming, um, I think is is still up for debate. But it does seem like there's good evidence that that warming led to humans. Um, dispersing um, and radiating throughout the continent and and driving a mass decline in the megafauna. So I think that climate did cause it. <laughs> but it does seem like because there isn't great evidence for the for the past cycles that it was likely the the humans that that drove it rather than directly um, a result of climate change. However, 
I will, I do want to say that there, and we've touched on this as well, there is better recovery of both archaeological sites and climate archives in more recent times. So it is possible that, you know, those, those megafaunal uh, fossils and then extinction just has not been recorded yet. Um, or that archive has been washed away, or, um, you know, there, there are other reasons that potentially that could exist for the lack of evidence in past uh, glacial periods. That's a great point. And I, th- I think that that really is a great comparison for the issue of today's climate change that we've been talking about, is that it isn't just the direct impact of things getting warmer it's all the stuff that's going to happen after that. You know? Exactly. <laughs> climate. It's... I remember having a conversation with a, a visitor at the museum one time who he had made, he, he somehow we got talking about climate change and he had made a comment about, uh, well, you know, climate change doesn't cause extinctions. You look in the past, you know, warming doesn't ever cause extinctions. And I went, well, that we came out of the last ice age and warmed and saw an extinction. And he said, well, that's, humans caused that right it got warmer they they needed they, they found new places to go and i was like right it got warmer and extinctions happened you know it's not right. just that everything gets a heat stroke it's that uh, you you've been throughout this episode using the term downstream effects which mm-hmm. is a great term that yeah two three four effects down the chain of that change in climate can have all sorts of other impacts well yeah it's, it's not that polar bears are going to sweat to death Right. It's that the ice flows that they rely on to hunt in between seasons are disappearing. So their hunting grounds are disappearing and they can't get enough food. Yeah. Right. It's not just the heat killing stuff. It's what that is causing in the various habitats these animals live in. Yeah, I do. De- I definitely agree. Um, I, I have talked to some biologists that, you know, there are specific fish species that the water is warming and their bodies just can't metabolize correctly. And so I think there are some examples mm-hmm. where it's like temperature extinction, but I think, yeah, totally. Generally it is all these processes together. And then those processes can then feed back on that first process and exacerbate the whole cycle. And, and that we see that a lot in, in climate systems. We could talk about climate past, present, uh, future all day. And this has been a really, really Excellent episode and an excellent discussion, but uh, we have to stop sometime so that we can go to sleep and our listeners can go to sleep or do whatever they have to do. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us for this episode. This has been great. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really wonderful getting this sort of paleontological um, viewpoint on um, on on, a, on an, the thing that is so near and dear to my heart. No, this was an awesome conversation. I learned tons. Yeah, it was great to oh, get. That's great the paleo climate perspective, which we are not experts in. And so this was really good. Thank you to all of our listeners for listening. Thank you to our new patrons. Thank you to our requester for this episode. As always, there will be a blog post that goes along with this episode with additional links and information so that you can dive deeper if you want. As always, reach out to us if you have comments, questions, requests for future stuff. We release new episodes every fortnight. So stay tuned for future episodes. There's a five coming up. There is. uh, Which means Allie will be back, which is very exciting. One more time, thank you again, Rachel, for joining us. Thank you to everyone for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.